Haxmanea. <laughs> All right. Let me start this. And here we are. Another year. Another holy day season. Another Yom Teruah upon us. And I have a special message today called Cycles of Seven, the Shemitah Babylon in the End Time. Cycles of Seven, the Shemitah Babylon in the End Time. Because here we are. It's gone fast, but we're halfway through the Shemitah cycle already. And uh, I know the way it works sometimes in our mind, you know, like the Shemitah comes and then we're focused on it and we're doing it and then it's over and we're thinking, okay, I'll, I'll think about it seven years later. But actually the Shemitah is a cycle. There are cycles of seven. So I think this message, especially for Yom Teruah, because Yom Teruah starts the Shemitah in a Shemitah year, I think it's really, really timing uh, as we'll see today. So, the end time is primarily about the restoration of the nation of Yahweh, right, Israel, the people of Yahweh, the Israelites, and the Torah of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh. Ending with the setting up of Yahweh's kingdom to this earth. So the pattern for end time events, the pattern for uh, prophecy especially, Yahweh uses with the Shemitah cycles. The world was created in six days and then the Sabbath. The Shemitah, of course, begins on Yom Terah, as we're saying. So let's start in Genesis 1. Let's just go over a little bit of this before we get into the prophetic side of the message. Genesis 1 and verse 14 <clears throat> says, And Elohim said, Let light sources be in the expanse of the heavens to divide between the day and the night. And let them be for signs, right? These are prophetic signs. Oath is the Hebrew word. And for seasons, right? Moedim, the holy days. And for days and for years. So we see, what is it? It's the uh, sun, the moon, and the stars are the things that set the times. And let them be for light sources in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made the two great light sources, the great light to rule the day, the, the, the sun, and the small light and the stars to rule the night, the moon and the stars. And Elohim said, let them, and Elohim set them in the expanse of the heavens <clears throat> to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide between the light and the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning, day four. So uh, here it is, this is day four, that basically time is created on day four, right? As far as the months. This would be new moon because he's creating the sun, the moon, and the stars on this day. So everything is starting. So this is the, the basic day of new moon, right? Uh, now, if we go to Genesis 2 and verse 2 and 3, we see, And on the seventh day Elohim completed his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work on it, which Elohim had created to make. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see the new moon is on day four, the creation of time for everything, for signs, for holy days, for days, for months. And yet, three days later is day seven still. So uh, this message has nothing to do with the lunar Sabbath, but I just want to show, because we're starting it with time, that the lunar Sabbath right here shows you from creation the lunar Sabbath cannot be correct, because according to the false lunar Sabbath theory, from the new moon, you count seven days until the Sabbath. And here we're seeing from day four and the new moon, three days was the Sabbath. And this is why the lunar Sabbath is for lunatics. It really it's, doesn't make any sense because cycles of seven, whether it's the Shabbat, the cycles of seven, right? Whether it's the Shemitah, the cycles of seven, everything in Yahweh's timing runs in cycles of seven. And the month cycle is 29.5 days. It doesn't run in cycles of seven. So there's no way that the, uh, the weekly Sabbath cycle can run according to the, the lunar cycle because they just don't fit. That's about as much as I'm going to say about that for today. Because really my point on today is to show you the importance of cycles of seven and particularly the Shemitah cycle in the end time we're living in. And I just got, inform I got so much information to really show you that is really it's it's really mind blowing when you think how many things that Yahweh does around the Shemitah cycle. So uh, let's go to Second Peter three. Second Peter three. 
because there's another premise here on cycles of seven. And it says, it's been a long time since I've written to you, my beloved, but now I write to you the second epistle in which by reminder I stir up your pure mind to remember. The words having been spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment given to us, given by us, the apostles of our Master and Savior. First knowing this, that during the last days, and here we are, scoffers will come walking according to their own lusts, right? We know this. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For from the time the fathers fell asleep, all things remain so from the beginning of creation. We're literally seeing people say exactly this. For this they willingly forget that the heavens were of old and the earth rose up from the waters and by means of water the word of Yahweh through which the world which then was being flooded by water perished. But the heavens and the earth now, having been stored up by the same word, are being kept for fire for a day of judgment and destruction of wicked men. And wow, can you imagine? The world's not going to end by a flood again. We already know that. Every time we see the rainbow after uh, rain, we know that that's Yahweh's promise. But it is going to end with fire. That's a Bible study I'm putting together. And we see it right here. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the rainforests are, are burning up. We're seeing forest fires from, from uh, Siberia and Russia to Alaska, uh, California, all over the world. We're seeing the world is burning up from this. But let not this one thing be hidden from you, beloved, that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Yahweh is not negligent concerning his promises, as some count negligence but is patient toward us, not wishing any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with rushing sound, and the elements shall separate as they burn, and earth and the works in it will be burned up. So again, we see this again, the fire that's coming from Yahweh, on the wrath of Yahweh, which is called the day of Yahweh. But my reason for coming this to, to this scripture now is to show that when mankind rejected the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden, the Sabbath became a sign of Yahweh's people. And what happened? Yahweh then gave man 6,000 years, the same way creation was in six days, in the seventh day, the Sabbath day, right? Cycles of seven. Now Yahweh has given man 6,000 years a day. This is 1,000 years, 1,000 years is a day. And at the end of the 6,000th year, which is 120 jubilees of 50. You know, we even know that from uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter. Yahweh says, I will give them 120 times or 120 jubilees. 120 times 50 is 6,000. Uh, th then we know that the thousand year millennial rest comes. So 6,000 years for man under Satan's rule, 1,000 year, the millennium against cycles of seven. So we have to get that in our mind. Like I always say, Understand Yahweh's pattern. Yahweh's pattern never changes. So when we're looking at these patterns of seven, everything runs in these patterns of seven of the Shemitah. The seven-year Shemitah is a sign to the world of Yahweh's sovereignty over his creation in the world. And that is why many wars, building of nations, crashing of nations, economic downturns, etc., happening during the Shemitah, right? Because the Shemitah is a year of building up, it's a year of tearing down. It's almost like every seventh year, Yahweh is winding his watch back. He's bringing it back because if you're obedient during the six years, the Shemitah is a great blessing and it's a time of building up. If you're not obedient those six years, especially, right, the last day of the sixth year, Elul 29, which is the last day before the Shemitah starts, all the debts are supposed to be released because the seventh year is a year of release. And if they don't do that, that's why trouble comes. And as we're going to see, some of the worst stock market crashes in the history, actually, the five worst stock market crashes in the history all came in Shemitah years. And the last two that were two, two of the, the, the worst actually happened on Elul 29. The very day that the debts were supposed to be released that they weren't, the two worst stock market crashes ever. And we'll go over that in a little bit when we're going over some of these things. But like I said, remember, because the Shemitah is about economics, stock market crashes, economics, nations being built up, nations being torn down. All these things happen in the Shemitah year. That's what it's about. Uh, that is why, like I said, wars, crashing of nations, economic downturns happening during the Shemitah. Just as Yahweh used nations and rulers, such as ancient Babylon, to fulfill his will, 
right? Remember Babylon was used. King Cyrus, we're going over now in, in Daniel Bible study, was used by Yahweh. In the end time, Babylon also, America is being used by Yahweh today as he uses nations such as end time Babylon and the Shemitah cycles for the same purpose. So this is what we have to understand. When we're getting into the cycles of seven and the Shemitah, especially in the end time, it's not just about Israel. Israel is an important part of it because, like we said, what's the main thing Yahweh is doing? He's, the main thing Yahweh is doing is the restoration of the nation, the restoration of the people, the restoration of the Torah. But within that, right, because the same as ancient Israel, as modern Israel, they're a small nation, and they're not the world dominion. The world dominion is coming from other people. And now, in this end-time generation, the world is being ruled by end-time Babylon. It clearly says that, that Babylon will rule the nations for 70 years. And just that scripture alone would have to tell you, it can't be any other nation than America. Because there's no other nation on the face of the earth that has been ruling the world for the last 70 years except America. Nobody, nobody even coming close to it. So today I want to get into this. I want to get into these cycles. Let me just again go over a little bit Leviticus 25. I'm not going to spend too much time there because it really isn't about teaching about the Shemitah and what we're to do. We'll get into that as time goes on here because we're halfway through the cycle. But I just want to get into what, for people maybe hearing this the first time, what exactly Shemitah is. Shemitah is the seventh year. It's the year release. It's the year that we let the uh, ground uh, rest, it's the year that we don't do any kind of harvesting uh, of crops. So Leviticus 25, 1 through 4, And Yahweh spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving to you, then the land will keep a Sabbath to Yahweh. You shall sow your field six years, and you shall prune your vineyard six years, and shall gather its produce. And in the seventh year, that's called the Shemitah, the seventh year, shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath to Yahweh. You shall not sow your field, and you shall not prune your vineyard. Okay, verse 6, And the Sabbath of the land shall be to you for food, to you and to your male slave and your female slave and your hired one and your tenant, those living among you. So in the seventh year, all the food that's naturally growing, it's to show Yahweh's sovereignty. It's to show that if we are obedient and we work for the six years, Yahweh will bless us. And he says it, we're not going there now, but he says, I'll bless you in the sixth, the seventh, even into the eighth year for three years if we're obedient to this. But this is what it is. The land Sabbath is the Shemitah. Every seventh year is a year of release. So again, it can be a blessing, just like Yom Teruah, right? Yom Teruah, which we're celebrating now. What does it mean? It means it's a day of clamoring. It's a day of noise. So when Yeshua returns, the ones who are waiting for him that get rewarded, it's going to be, yes, well, praising. The ones that didn't want him that are going to get burned up and their eyeballs melt in their sockets are going to be screaming and gnashing of teeth. So it's the same thing with the Shemitah. It can be a great blessing or it can be a curse. And that's why nations are built up in the Shemitah. Nations are torn down in the Shemitah. Uh, what's the punishment for not keeping the Shemitah? Leviticus 26, go a page or two over. In verse 31, Leviticus 26 and verse 31. And if they don't keep it, he says, I will make your cities a waste and you shall make your sanctuaries desolate and I shall not smell your sweet fragrances. And I shall make the land desolate and your enemies who are living in it shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and draw out the sword after you and your land shall become a waste and your cities shall become a desolation. Then... Then after Yahweh does this, then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation. And you shall be in the land of your enemies. Then the land shall enjoy its, sab its rest and shall enjoy its Sabbaths. It shall rest all the days of the desolation, that which it is not rested in your Sabbaths while you lived on it. So very clearly Yahweh said to them, if you don't keep the Sabbath and what it seems to be from the time of the kingdom. From the time it started with King Saul and then, of course, King David, it seems like these Sabbaths were never kept, these Shemitah years. We don't have records of it. And as we look at the desolation, because look what it says here in the next scripture, Second Chronicles 36, 20 and 21, says, And he exiled to Babylon those who had escaped the sword, and they were slaves to him and to his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Going over that now in Daniel in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh in the mouth of Jeremiah, 
until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation, it kept the Sabbath to the full measure of 70 years. Okay, so what is Yahweh saying? Very interesting. We'll see that too. 70 is a number of endpoint when we look. So now he's saying there were 70 Shemitahs that were not kept. That's 490 years. So if you count from the time that this is happening when they go into captivity and you add 490 years, you come out to somewhere around 10, uh, 1060. That's right around the time that King Saul is becoming king. So it seems they never kept the Shemitah years during the time that the kings were there in Israel. But what does he say? 70, the number of endpoint. Very important number, as we're in now, as we're going to see. That for 70 Shemitahs that were never kept, 490 years, they will be 70 years in captivity. One year for each Shemitah. And that's what they were. They went into captivity in 609. It started. That was the first uh, uh, siege by Nebuchadnezzar. And they were in captivity until 539, 538. That's when... Uh, the captivity ended 70 years in captivity. So, very interesting to that, right? Judah would be 70 years in captivity, an endpoint number for the 70 Shemitahs they did not keep. And again, 70, very interesting, because 7 times 10, it's 10 Shemitahs. 10 is the number of incomplete government. So, 70, like I say, is an endpoint number, like we saw in Psalm 90. You know, the life cycle is 70 years. 70, we see many times Babylon will rule the nations for 70 years. After 70 years, uh, Israel goes back into the land, Judah. So 70 very clearly is an endpoint number. And it's important now because as we're seeing, Israel just kept their 70th Passover this year. And Yahweh's judgment says to come after this. So it doesn't seem to be too far. So again, the Shemitah is a year of building up. Got to remember that. And a year of tearing down depending on your obedience. Of individuals, it could be individuals, as we'll see, especially leaders of the world, of countries, but particularly of nations. The Shemitah has to deal particularly with nations, blessing of nations and cursings of nations, and deals with physical blessings of obedience and cursing for disobedience. It stands to reason that in the end times, the Shemitah would not only affect the nation of Israel, but also Babylon. Because Babylon is the economic steam engine of the world. So you can't have physical economic blessings without Babylon being involved to one degree or another. So we're going to see, although Israel, definitely almost everything important that happened to Israel happens around the Shemitah year. Babylon, who's the ruler of the nations, also all the things happening in the Shemitah year. Babylon is the military and economic superpower in the end time for 70 years. And except for Jerusalem... Babylon is mentioned more in Scripture than any other place on earth. So except for Jerusalem, Yahweh set apart Holy City, right? You know, his eternal capital where the Garden of Eden was. Babylon is mentioned more than any other city in Scripture. So let's go a little bit about Babylon to show this, because uh, many of the things I'm going to show you from the last hundred years have to deal not only with Israel, but many with Babylon and the creation of the global Satan's end time government. But Jeremiah 50 and verse 23, how the hammer of the whole earth is cut off and broken, how Babylon has become a rune among the nations. So Babylon is the hammer of the earth, one that pounds. It shows its military and political strength. Babylon is the hammer of the earth, no doubt about that. There's no other nation on earth today, none, zero, that has, America has bases all around the world. Everywhere in the world you go, whether it's Asia, whether it's Europe, whether it's uh, America, you know, you name it. Babylon has military bases everywhere in the world that you can imagine. Revelation 18, 9 through 11, and then 15 through 18, right? And the kings of the earth will weep for her, for Babylon, and will wail over her. Those having fornicated and have luxuriated with her, when they see the smoke of her burning standing from afar because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe to the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment comes. And we know in, in Scripture, cities and countries are interchangeable. Babylon was a city, Babylon was a nation. So we see this, that uh, you know it's not just a city, but Babylon being of the nation. Uh, and then it says, and the merchants of the earth, verse 11, Revelation 18, 11, the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their merchandise anymore, right? Said this many times. China is a seller, they're not a buyer. Europe is, a, is not a buyer. 
America is the one Babylon, end time Babylon, that's buying everybody's junk everywhere you look, and that's why you have dollar stores everywhere you look with all the uh, stuff coming from China and all the other places. Verse 15 now, the merchants of these things, the ones being enriched from her, from Babylon, will stand from afar because of the fear of her for torment, weeping and mourning, and saying, woe, woe to the great city, having been clothed in linen and purple and scarlet, showing the great riches of Babylon, and having been girdled with gold and precious stone and pearls. For in one hour such great wealth was desolated, and every ship pilot and all companies on the ships and sailors and as many as worked the sea stood afar and cried, seeing the smoke of her burning, saying, what other is like the great city, right? There's never been a country in the world, and New York is the city of Babylon, America being the country, but there's never in the world been a country like America. There's never been in the world a military might like America, an economic power like America, you know, a pleasure-seeking country like America, a technology like they've created, nothing even remotely close to it. The other scripture is Jeremiah 25, 11 through 13. Jeremiah 25, 11 through 13. And this whole land shall be a waste and a heart, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. The other scripture that says this, talks about at the, at when according to the mouth of Yahweh. So it's according to the mouth of Yahweh when 70 years are up. And it will be when 70 years are fulfilled, verse 12, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says Yahweh, and I will make it everlasting rooms. And I will bring on that land all my words which I've spoken against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. So very clearly, we know we're not in year 5 or year 10 or year 20 or 30. The 70 years for Babylon are almost finished. But it's up to Yahweh when that is. But remember, as we're showing here, as I'm going to show very clearly, everything runs around the Shemitah. Everything runs around cycles of 7. And that's why it's important for us to understand because we're halfway through the Shemitah cycle. And this next one coming could be a really, really pivotal, important one in the world with many, many world changes. So uh, no time to relax. It's really time to prepare. So we see when 70 years have passed, according to the mouth of Yahweh, Babylon will be destroyed. And like I said, 70, end point number again, 7 Shemitahs times 10, 10 incomplete government, right? Uh, so let me read you now some things about the last 100 years and the Shemitah. Uh, some of these facts are coming from Jonathan Kahn's book, The Harbinger, but I do want to say up front is that Jonathan Kahn has the Shemitah year wrong. <laughs> I don't know how he does it, how he gets the Shemitah year wrong, but he doesn't have the correct Shemitah year, but that's uh, neither here nor there. But I just wanted to mention that, that a few of these facts are coming from that book. Uh, so again, the Shemitah is a time of building up, it's a time of tearing down, dependent on obedience or disobedience. So just to show you how overwhelming this is, because, you know, people can be blind, you know, like Yeshua said, sometimes uh, the Pharisee said, are you saying that we're blind? He said, I came that the ones that are blind can see, and the ones that claim to see will be blind. So people can blind themselves, but I'm not going to show you one thing here or two things. I'm going to show you from 1917, which was a Shemitah year, 1718, for the last 100 years, Every single Shemitah and just about every single important thing that's happened in this world has happened on the Shemitah. I mean, what are the coincidences of something like that happening and nations being built up and nations being built down? So let me read all this to you. Okay, praise Yahweh, we're taping this. This will be, you know, online that you can listen to it a second and a third time. But there is so much that has happened. And when you see this, when you see the Shemitah cycle, it literally, it's almost like when Daniel was... You know, so scared when he saw the, the beast. This is scary because it really shows you that it's no coincidence. It really is no coincidence. And as we're going to see, uh, the Shemitah cycles are running out. You know, the Yahweh's 6,000 years for man is running out. His millennial is coming. And he is giving us so many signs over and over and over and over and over again that there's no one. There's, it, it's impossible to, to deny it. It would be like... like 10 to the uh, 1,000th power, a number that doesn't even exist, would be the 
law of odds and probability that this is just all coincidence. So let me start here. 1917, 1918. This is really the beginning of the end time. It's really interesting because when you look at a generation, you know, like Yeshua said, this generation will not pass till all these things happen. A generation of Bible can be 40 years. We saw that. The children of Israel in the wilderness, 40 years. We see this over and over. Generation could also be 70 years, right? We said the life cycle is 70 years, like Psalm 90, you know, if you live 70 years. And a generation could also be 100 years. You know, we see it, even like 100 years of Noah building the ark. So we see that all three of them can be used as a generation. And in the end time, I think all three of them do come together. But from 1917, 100 years now, let's look at what's happened. Because, you know, in the world we're living in today, we're getting more and more technology, right? And more and more knowledge. But people are becoming stupider and stupider. Because they're all falling for fake news and they're not looking. If you look at the history over the last 100 years and you actually see the facts of it, there's no way of denying what we're going over today. Okay? Cycles of seven, the Shemitah Babylon, and the end time. 1970, 1918. The Industrial Re uh, Revolution starts in the late 1800s, right? And it sets the stage for America, America to become the world power. Because remember, in the 1800s, America was not the world power. It was Great Britain, right? It was the UK. Matter of fact, they used to say that the, 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 uh, the sun does not set on the British Empire because they were from India all the way across to the United States. But that ended. In the late 1800s, the power changed. By April 1917, okay, the United States enters World War I and officially becomes a world superpower militarily as well as financially. World War I ends in 1918, right? And this is a pivotal, a pivotal year because listen to everything that happened in that Shemitah from 1917 to 1918. The signing of the Belfort Declaration to make the, the, the State of Israel. That happened during that Shemitah year. The end of the Ottoman Empire, right? The Ottoman Empire was, they, I mean, they're connected in to the Roman Empire from the 1500s, from 1517 to 1917, 400 years, the Ottoman Empire ruled not only Israel, all of the Middle East. And it's important in the end time because the Ottoman Empire is from Turkey, which will be resurrected, and that's exactly what, what uh, the president there, Erdogan, wants to do is resurrect the, the Roman Empire. But that ended in 1917. That ended, and if it didn't end, Israel couldn't have become a nation. So the Belfort Declaration by Lord Belfort of, of, of UK that sets the stage for Israel to become a nation. The Ottoman Empire ends, right? The building of nations, the taking down of nations, right? Creating a way for Israel. And then Lebanon, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia all to be created from this one Shemitah. And the idea of the League of Nations, right? The League of Nations was what started world government before United Nations, Woodrow Wilson's 14-point speech came in January 1918. So this is all happening in this one Shemitah. The German Second Reich fell apart. Nations built up, nations taken down. The Austrian-Hungarian monarchs, that's the end of it. That was the end of it. The Russian czars, that's the end of it. The Soviet Union begins, right? So all of the kings were falling and all the end-time players were starting to build up. The stock market crashed in 1917 again. 40% was wiped out. And also, it was the official end of the British Empire. It was the first time ever that Britain became a debtor nation. It was in 1917-1918. So this is big. Many of these things are happening here. Then 1924 and 1925, evolution is outlawed in Tennessee and Texas schools, and in New York, the American Association for Advanced Atheism is formed. So now, while, while, right, the years are building up, the years are tearing down. While some of the ones there are trying to hold on to creation of Yahweh, others are forming what we see now of this worldwide movement that Yahweh doesn't exist, happened in the Shemitah. Benito Mussolini becomes dictator in the Shemitah. Adolf Hitler resurrects his political power and that's why it's called the Third Reich, because the Second Reich ended in 1917, 1918. Then we get to the next one, 1931, 1932, right? Beginning of the Great Depression in the United States that went worldwide. The Empire State Building was finished, the tallest building in the world at that time. And we're going to see the building of buildings, tall towers, has a lot to do with 
not only Shemitah, but it has a lot to do with, with pride and, and, and nations wanting to make a name for themselves. Uh, 86% of the stock market was wiped out. 86% here. So like I said, it has a lot to do with building of nations, taking down nations, and money that happens in the Shemitah. 1938-1939, the next Shemitah, the beginning of World War II. Stock market crashes again right after the Shemitah begins, the day after it begins, bringing in a big recession. Then 1945-1946, the end of World War II. World War II starts in the Shemitah, World War II ends in the Shemitah. It's the beginning of the last generation now, because now, this one, 1945-1946, this Shemitah starts, United Nations is created at this time, right? The, the end time beast of Daniel, the world government, plus the IMS, the International Monetary Fund, that's going to that's gonna fund all of these things, the World Bank. Uh, America emerges as end time Babylon, they're the world leader militarily, economically, and the dollar becomes the world reserve currency, right? Babylon is the head of gold. So this is where now, Babylon in 1917, it starts. That's like the, 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 the laying, that's the laying of the seeds to it. But 1945 is really when Babylon becomes Babylon. That's where they're becoming this in it. Plans are laid to build a World Trade Center. So when Babylon becomes this world superpower, that's what they do. They start laying the plans to say, we have to build another building. Even though they had the tallest building in the world, they said, we even want a bigger one. We want a bigger tower. And what do they do? They set up in the Shemitah. That's when they laid the plans to start building the World, the, uh, world Trade Center, the Twin Towers. Towers are a biblical sign of security and strength, as we're going to see. Then 1952, 1953, the next one, right? Queen Elizabeth takes the throne as King George VI dies. Now, she's still alive today. She's still on the throne. Do you know in three years she will be 70 years as queen? 70. It's an end point, right? And they're saying she's going she's gonna, to uh, uh, retire soon if she's still alive, but she seems to be in good health. And it'll probably be in that Shemitah year. Comes to the throne in the Shemitah, probably will leave in the Shemitah. You know, abdicate to who's ever coming next. But Queen Elizabeth takes the throne. King Hussein of Jordan, another big player in the end time, took the throne in this year, 52-53, and the Korean War starts, right? Building of nations, tearing down nations, 1952-1953. 1959 and 1960, right? What did we say? The building of nations, tearing down. Listen to all of these countries that became free sovereign countries in that one Shemitah. Niger, Burkina Faso, Central, Central African Republic, Republic of Congo, Cyprus, Ghana, Somalia, Madagascar, Mali, Tonga, Chad, Cameroon, Senegal, and Nigeria. All of those countries got their freedom in that Shemitah. Can you imagine? All of them. Now, why not? Why not the year before, the year after, or during the seven years? All of them. All of them in that Shemitah. And beside that, we said it's the year of building up, year of tearing down. Chile had the world's largest ever earthquake, a 9.5. That's the largest earthquake there's ever been in the history of man. It happened in that Shemitah. Same thing. Next one, 66-67, the Six-Day War in Israel, right? Beginning of the building of the World Trade Center. So they set the plans in 45. Took a lot of time to put all this together. They start building the Trade Center in 1966, a Shemitah year. Shemitah year 66, 67. Next one, 73, 74. This is now the top of Babylon's power. Their height of their power is ending now. It's there at the top of the mountain. They're going down because look what happens. The Yom Kippur War, Israel has the Yom Kippur War in 1973, 74, again a Shemitah. They finished the World Trade Center. So it's the finishing of the towers, but now they do something and it's the tallest building in the world. But 7374 is when they legalize abortion. And that's the end of Babylon. That's the height of their power. That's where from here on end, it's only going to get down. And what happens during 7374? Babylon's strength starts to fall. There's a stock market crash. There's a recession. 45% of the wealth of the stock market is wiped out. The GDP, the, the gross national product of the country, shrinks by 70%. And Great Britain exchange, stock exchange, lost 74% in that year. The gold standard was dropped, right? Because what does that mean? That from the time Babylon 
became Babylon in 45. Babylon had all the gold. Many of the nations in World War II sent their gold to America, to Fort Knox, to hold it there. Matter of fact, there's been a thing in the last couple of years, Germany wants their gold back, and America's saying they don't have it, but whatever. But the point of it is, the dollar being the reserve currency was based on gold. It was based on how much gold they had, and that's how much money you could print. And you can't print more money than you had gold. Well, in 1973-74, in that Shemitah, when America's height now is going to start to collapse, they dropped the gold standard, right? Which is really amazing because Daniel 2.38, who is the head of gold? Babylon is the head of gold. So when they're dropping the gold standard, what's telling you that? Their strength is gone now. Now they're going to be a paper tiger from here on end. And Vietnam ends and America loses the first war they ever lost in their history. So 73-74 is a bad Shemitah because America brings abortion in and this is going to be the, the start of a downfall economically, militarily, and everything. But dropping the gold standard is big because now everything will just be debt. Everything they can print money, it doesn't mean anything. It's just the money is being printed based on nothing. It's just being printed based on debt notes. It's not even money because it's a debt note. But the gold standard is dropped in the Nishmita. 8081, the end of the hostage crisis with USA and Iran. And again, the beginning of a stock market downturn when the Shemitah begins. Another stock market downturn. 87, 88, Black Monday. I think it's the third largest, or at that time, it was the biggest single day loss ever. Black Monday, stock market crashes as the Shemitah is just beginning again, right? So even the time frame of it. 94, 95, the next one, ratifying the Oslo Accords, right? To give the land of Yahweh away. Oh, one of the worst things that could have happened. It happens again in a Shemitah year. That brings us to 2001, 2002. And what happens at the beginning of the Shemitah? 911. 911 in New York City. Revelation 18 through 2 through 10. In one hour, the towers fall. In one hour, literally, it was 54 minutes from the time the plane hit to the towers fall. Like it said, in one hour, all that wealth comes to nothing. The symbol of economic and military supremacy is gone. They had the second worst stock market crash in the history. That again happened on Elul 29. And yet, what was America's uh, answer? Were they repentant? Did they see they're doing something wrong? No. They actually, in Isaiah 9 and verse 10, says, The bricks have fallen, but we will build with cut stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will substitute with cedars instead. And literally, this was their answer. In the Congress of the United States of America, they read this scripture. They read the scripture in defiance of Yahweh's punishment to them and saying, we don't care. We are going to be defiant. You build our buildings down, we'll build with, you know, the bricks of foam, we'll build with cut stones. And wow, really, really amazing that we see. So the next Shemitah now, 208 and 209, the worst one-day stock market crash in the history of the country comes when? Again, Elul 29, the very day that Yahweh says either release the debts or I'll curse you. They have the worst stock market crash ever. And how many points did it drop? 777.7 points. If Yahweh isn't perfect to show who's, who's the one who's controlling this, right? It's the seventh anniversary of the towers falling and the worst stock market point drop ever in, in, in the country. Matter of fact, the five graded, greatest stock market drops ever all happened in the Shemitah. So like I said, building up a nation's taking down of nations. So I want to stop there now before we get to 2015 and 16 because it really looked like, if you, if, if you follow this pattern, it looked like 2015, 2016 was really, I don't know, be the end of it, but it would be almost the end of it, but we'll get to that in a minute. What I want to do is I want to just share before I continue with that, I want to get into towers, though. I want to show you the importance of towers, that this wasn't just something that was coincidental or something that, uh, okay, so a tower fell. What's the big deal? Because in ancient society, churches and temples were all, always the big, biggest buildings, right? They were the bima. They were all, always built on the hill because that was the biggest building. Why? Because they wanted people to see uh, 
the, the, the worship toward the false deity that they were doing. In the 1800s, that changed. And it started to be that nations, and it started with Great Britain, they started building the, build, the biggest buildings in the world to show their might because they were the world empire. Well, in the late 1800s, when America starts taking over from Great Britain, what do they do? They built three of the largest buildings in New York City, not, not once, you know, they, before the Trade Center and those, but they built bigger than, than Great Britain, and they took over. And then, like we saw, in 1931, the Empire State Building was built the biggest building in the world, 34th Street in New York City, that's there. But this was showing buildings and might and height of buildings is showing what? It's showing pride. It's showing power uh, that's there. In the early 1900s, like I said, they built three more buildings until the Empire State Building, 1931. And then the World Trade Centers, right? The Twin Towers, the dual prophecy here. The plans are made in 1945, a Shemitah year. They start building it in 1966, a Shemitah year. They finish building in 1973, a Shemitah year. And it's just destroyed in 2001, a Shemitah year. <laughs> Can it all be coincidence? All of it, the building of the nation, the tearing of the nation, every single one happened in the Shemitah year. So let's go to Genesis 11, because let's see the, the importance of, of towers in the Bible, what it really means. Because it's not just a building. Like I said, in ancient times, it was it was building on the, on the bima, on the high places, these temples and even churches. But in the end time, because Babylon is about money, it's about power, it's about influence, it's about pride, they wanted to build these, like, obelisks. It's almost like an obelisk, the tallest obelisk in the world they wanted to build. So Genesis 11 says the whole earth was of one lip and one speech. Just like you have today through the internet, right? Through computers, everybody is one lip and one speech. And it happened as they traveled from the east, they found a level valley in the land of Shinar. And they lived there. And each one said to his neighbor, come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly, right? The bricks have fallen, but we will build with them. Cut stone. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower. The word in Hebrew is migdal. With its top, the heavens. And make a name for ourselves that we not be scattered on the face of the earth. So why do they want to build this tower? Did they want to do it because they wanted to uh, be able to fit more people there? No, they wanted to build a tower up to the heavens to show their supremacy over Yahweh, right? Just like Nasa, right? Nasa, to lift up is the word in Hebrew. Uh, you know, although uh, you are lifted up Nassau to the heavens, I will cut you down to the earth. And what's the name of the space program of America? NASA, N-A-S-A, NASA. And that's the point of it. Why does man want to go to the moon? And why do they want to go to Mars? And why? Because they want to show their supremacy over Yahweh. And that's why they built these towers, like they're saying here. Let us build a tower to the heavens to make a name for ourselves, right? And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. And Yahweh said, Behold, the people is one in the lip, one to all of them. And this they are beginning to do, and now all which they have determined to do will not be restrained from them. Come, let us go down and mix up their language, so that they cannot understand man's evil speech. And that's what Yahweh did there. But in the end time now, because of Yahweh's purpose, he's allowing it again for mankind to have one speech and one common speech that's here. So we see... They, make, they wanted to make a name for themselves. And, you know, the root word for the word migdal, the word for tower, it literally means, right, to be lifted up, to be magnified, to become great, arrogant, filled with pride. So that's really what it's about. They're making a name for themselves because they want to be lifted up, they want to be magnified, they want to become great, arrogant, and filled with pride. And that's why Yahweh is not pleased that man is building these towers, not to give him the credit, they're not building the Twin Towers to say, look at our Creator who blessed us with all these things in the United States of America, Babylon. They're doing it to say, my might, like Nebuchadnezzar, remember? My might has gotten me all of these. Let's go to Daniel 4 and verse 10. Daniel 4 and verse 10, because we see a parallel here. Daniel 4 and verse 10 and 11, it says, As to the visions of my head on my bed, I was looking, and behold, a tree was in the middle of the earth, and its height was great. So this tree is like the tower. The height is going up to the heavens, and it was great. 
the tree became great and strong, and its height reached to the heavens, just like the Tower of Babel, right? Let us make a tower which the top the heavens, and its appearance to the ends of the earth. So that's the point of it. They want to make this so high that all the ends of the earth will see their pride and their greatness. And this is what Yahweh was saying to Nebuchadnezzar. But drop down to verse now 20, and look what he says. The tree that you saw, which became great and strong, whose height reached to the heavens and its appearance to all the earth, verse 22, it was you, O king, Nebuchadnezzar. For you have become great and strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the sky, and your rule is to the end of the earth. So that's what it's showing. They're showing this, that Babylon, by building these towers, especially the twin towers, that right, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's saying it twice. Number one, because it's a dual prophecy for ancient Babylon, then end time Babylon, but also to show our might is greater than anything that's ever been on this earth. And I say, when you look at Nebuchadnezzar, wow, <laughs> you know, he didn't have much on President Trump. They both come from the same mold. You know, Trump Tower, Trump Tower, he wants to build the same thing. Build towers, build these big buildings and build the best hotels in the world that he makes a name for himself. Everything he does, he puts his name on it because he wants a tower, a migdal. He wants to be magnified, become great, to be arrogant, to be lifted with pride. And is it a coincidence that Donald Trump is president now, now at this time? I don't think so. Isaiah 30 and verse 25 Isaiah 30 and verse 25 says, And on every high mountain and on every high hill shall be rivulets lifted up, streams of water, and a day of great slaying when towers fall. So Yahweh in his word actually puts the destruction of nations with their towers falling because it's symbolic, right? The twin towers, there were two towers. I used to work there. I've been in the, I was in those buildings hundreds of times. They're not military. They, they, they can't protect you against an evasion. They were symbolic. They were symbolic of their great might and their great power and their great arrogance and their great pride that we could build these towers up to the heaven, right? But that's why Yahweh symbolically says when he takes nations down, he'll tear down their towers because it's nothing but pride and arrogance. Uh, Zephaniah 3.6. Zephaniah 3.6. I have cut off nations. Their towers are ruined. I made their streets waste, and I think of when the towers were falling, all the dust and all that stuff that came, people had it filled with them, and unfortunately, a lot of these people have gotten cancer now, you know, and they said, like, the first responders, it's terrible, but it's just like the scripture says, I have cut off nations, their towers are ruined, I made their streets waste that no one passes by, their cities are laid waste without a man from there being not one living there. So when Yahweh cuts off a nation, he says, their towers are ruined. The importance of the Twin Towers falling, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Like I said, dual prophecy, both towers fell. The strength is over. The strength is over, you know. So the same way when Jeremiah prophesied of Jerusalem's downfall, he prophesied for 25 years before it actually happened because Yahweh is merciful and he gives time to repentance. But I can tell you right now, Babylon's best days are behind them. And with 70 years, according to Mount Yahweh, until their ruin, uh, wow, I think they're on borrowed time already. But like I said, you know, we see here that the word of Yahweh, and if you look at the Shemitah cycle, there's no doubt about it. So let's get back to the Shemitah cycle. Because from everything, and I'm human, I'm not claimed to be a prophet, you know, I look at everything, and then I'm looking at what's happening, and, and, and sharing from my standpoint of what I believe that Yahweh is doing. But from everything that we saw up to the Shemitah in 2008-2009, in all actuality, I really thought when we got to 2015-16 that that would be, you know, because we saw 2001, worst stock market crash, 2008, and all on a little 29, I really thought, wow, this is it for Babylon. And uh, especially when big things happen. And remember, from 1945, when Babylon first starts, to, to 2015 is exactly 70 years. But it's 70 years at the mouth of Yahweh. It's not 70 years at the mouth of the UN. So uh, maybe that's where I, I was wrong. But I really thought 2015, 2016 was going to be a really, really bad Shemitah for Babylon and then the, this beginning of this world war. Would have. I forgot one thing, though. I forgot that Yahweh does nothing unless he does tell his servants the prophets, meaning his prophets in the Bible, and that Yahweh will do nothing unless he warns the people first. So 2015, 2016... 
It was a major thing that happened in that Shemitah. You know what happened in that Shemitah? Donald Trump became president. Donald Trump, who was never supposed to win, and that's why from the day he got in office, they've been trying to get rid of him. From the day he got in office. Why? Because he's not a globalist. Because he's not part of this world government they're doing, and every day he's in there, he's destroying everything they're doing. You know? So, President Donald Nebuchadnezzar Trump comes in office. And I don't, nobody expected it. The New World Order didn't expect it. The people didn't expect it. Everyone didn't expect that. But what happens, Yahweh takes, and I'm not going to go into there, into the, the dream of, of uh, Pharaoh in Genesis 41. We went into that several other times. But we know from Pharaoh's dream, right, there's seven good years, you know, where all of this good years are happening, good things are happening, and plenty of food and the animals and everything else. And right after that comes seven bad years. So it's like Yahweh put in there, 2015, 16, in that Shemitah, it's like Yahweh put a prophetic Shemitah cycle in there. It's like he gave us a, a, an extra Shemitah for us to prepare ourselves. Because if 2015, 16, if Babylon did fall and the Mark of the Beast came then, I don't think we were ready. Do you know we only started our kibbutzes in that year? That was the year it started. So Yahweh blessed us with that. But wow, nobody expected President Trump to be elected. And then what happens? The economy from nowhere dramatically changes. And they go from being on the, 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 the brink of, the, uh, of distinction. You know, in 2008, 2009, almost the whole system collapsed. Where now they're having the best years America has ever had of being a nation. Talk about Pharaoh's dream, right? And it shows Yahweh's sovereignty from nowhere. And the key is, I don't know if this actually started, though, when President Trump took over, if it started in the last year or two of President Obama's, because the economy was changing some at that time. So we really don't know for sure when the seven bad years are coming. It might come right at the Shemitah. It might come the year before the Shemitah. You know, nobody really knows. But one thing we do know is the seven good years are here for Yahweh giving the time and the seven bad years are coming. So uh, that's the prophecy coming from the dream of Pharaoh in Genesis 41. If someone hasn't heard this before, you can go read it for yourself. But very, very clearly, he says it twice. And the reason why he says it twice is because it's dual prophecy. It was for Pharaoh in that time. It's for our time now. And that's why now we're halfway through the Shemitah cycle already. We need in our communities and we need to start preparing. Because I'm telling you, just like in Genesis 41, you'll see immediately what happens after the seven good years are up. Boom. Famine comes immediately. And within the first year, the people had to sell everything they had to Pharaoh to survive. And by the third year, they had to sell themselves into slavery, the mark of the beast. So we're seeing this. And this is why it's merciful that Yahweh gave us this little prophetic insight here, insert, and that we have this. So this is what happens. Pharaoh's dream comes. If we go to Daniel 4 in verse 23... It's very interesting. Daniel 4 in verse 23 says, And the king saw a guarding cherub and a holy one coming down from the heavens and saying, Cut down the tree. Remember the tree of Babylon, the great tree, and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of its root in the earth, even with a band of iron and bronze in the grass of the field. And let them be wet with the dew of the heavens, and his lot will be with the beasts of the field until seven times pass over in one Shemitah. So, there's a very good possibility, and maybe not, but there's a very good possibility by the time the Shemitah is going to come that America is going to economically collapse. And then for seven years, like it says, it's not done. The stump's there, because I've always said this, there's two destructions to Babylon. The first is the sovereignty taken away, and the second is where, before Yeshua returns, where everything is wiped out over there. So very, very clearly, we see this until seven times, one Shemitah. And here we are. Three years went quick. We only have three more years, and the next Shemitah is coming, and everything is moving very, very quickly. And wow, when we look at everything that's happened to this point, why would we doubt that Yahweh is going to continue? Why would we doubt anything of it? So uh, let's look at now 22-23. That's the next Shemitah, right? Could be the start of the seven bad years, right? Could be. Beside the land rest, the Shemitah year also acts as prophecy markers for Yahweh's people who are faithful in keeping it. And like we said, 
The towers are connected with nations seeking power. Now I want to show you this, which is really interesting, because four, many numbers in the Bible are important. We know that, right? Number one is Yahweh's number. Number three is the number of resurrection. Uh, number five is the number of grace. Number seven is the completeness, the cycles of seven. Eight is new beginnings, right? Nine is judgment. These all go all through the Bible. Forty, number of trial, and number of overcoming. The number four is a very interesting number because the number four is a world number, like north, south, east, and west. And many times, the four cherubs are on the four corners of the earth in Revelation, right? And they're ready for this great war. When you see the number four, it's usually something that is happening worldwide. It's, it's, world, uh, it's a world number. So it's really interesting that when we look at the number four with these Shemitahs, in 1917, it was the end of World War I, right, and the rise of America as the world superpower. Four Shemitahs later, exactly, four Shemitahs, 28 year, brings us to 1945, when America officially becomes end time Babylon, right, the leader of the world, the, the, uh, the, the uh, dollar being the reserve currency, all that stuff, and that happens to be the year they also named to start the Trade Center. Four Shemitahs later, right? Brings us to 1973-74, the height of Babylon's power, but the sign of their downfall with legalizing abortion. The next seven years are filled with financial turmoil, high inflation, interest rates at 21%, leading to taking American hostages by Iran in 1979. Now, you go four Shemitahs later from there, right? We said 73-74, America's power is at their height. They're only going down. Four Shemitahs later is 2001. Four Shemitahs later is the tearing down of the towers in New York City and the signaling of the tearing down of the strength of USA Babylon and the second worst stock market crash in their history happens to happen on a little 29 the very day that debts are supposed to be released. Now, go four Shemitahs from there and what does it bring us to? 2028-2029. What is interesting about that? Because if you look at the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9, there's 70 weeks until the Messiah comes, right? We know it's a dual prophecy because the Messiah comes twice. The first time he came, the decree went out by Artaxerxes I, 457 B.C., exactly 483 years later after 69 sevens is 27 A.D. and Yeshua is the Messiah. To the T, to the T it comes in. Well, in the end time it says the same thing, right? Because it talks about uh, the the... Jerusalem being restored, right, after 77s, that Jerusalem would be restored until Messiah the Prince coming. And it's really interesting. It says the same thing. When the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem till Messiah the Prince would be 69 sevens, or 70 sevens. And that happened in 1538 during the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire, like I said, it was really, really big that in 1917 that was over. Because that was 400 years they controlled the Middle East and basically controlled the world. But in 1538, Suleiman I gives this decree to go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem, most of them, you do have some Herodian stones, but most of them were built by Solomon. And if you add 490 years to 1538, you come to 2028. You come exactly to the end of this next four. Four years from from. 1917, 1945, four Shemitahs later, 73, four Shemitahs later, 2001, four Shemitahs later, 2028, 29. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, how much can be coincidence? It can't be. And here we are in this, there's a 10-year pocket here where so much is going to happen. The fall of Babylon, the rise of the beast power, Yeshua taking the bride to the wilderness, which we already started to do. The persecution on the saints, the great martyrs. We're in this time where all this stuff is, is the, we're in the beginning. The, the, the birth pangs of all these things happening now, coming, the mark of the beast, all these things. And this is why a message like this is so important. Because now's the time we have to prepare. Now's the time we have to prepare. And like I said, Hebrew, the word for tower is migdal. The root is gadol, gadol. To increase, to be lifted up, to become great or magnified, enlarged. Arrogance. In 1945, the UN creates the plan for global government, the World Bank, the IMF. U.S. dollars, world reserve currency. Babylon becomes the head of the nations. He can, Babylon controlled all the world's waterways. Had the military bases in most of the world to be the world policemen. Controlled the money supply. 
through the gold and had achieved world power like no nation ever did before. And that's why they needed to build two bigger towers to show their strength. And in 2001, when those towers came down, like it says in Zephaniah 3, 6, I have cut off nations, their towers are ruined, I made their streets waste. Yahweh is showing Yahweh's sovereignty in this. Mankind is built on building towers, going to the moon and beyond to show his strength when only need we strength, when only we need strength in Yahweh. And my question as we're getting ready to end here, because prophetically this is this is just mind blowing. It's mind blowing to think how Yahweh is working everything in this Shemitah cycle. And it's, it's, it's happened for the last hundred years, every single Shemitah cycle. But now on a personal note, my question to you is, what towers in your life have to be taken down, right? We see the, the, the word for this, pride, arrogance, right? Being magnified in our own eyes. What towers in our life have to be torn down as time is running out? Luke 21, 5 and 6. Luke 21, 5 and 6. It says, and as some was speaking about the sanctuary, it had been adorned with beautiful stones and gifts. He, Yeshua, said, These things that you see, the days will come in which not one stone will be spared. There will not be one stone upon another that will not be pulled down. Right? Yeshua isn't looking to build an earthly sanctuary now. He'll do it when he returns. But now he's building a spiritual sanctuary through his body. That's what he said in, in the book of John. His body is the sanctuary. So he literally said, not one stone would be built upon, upon another. So what, what towers in our life need to be torn down as Yahweh is tearing down the towers of Babylon in world government? Last scripture, Isaiah 2 and verse 11 and 12. Isaiah 2 and verse 11 and 12 says, The lofty eyes of the proud shall be humbled, and the pride of man shall be bowed down. But Yahweh, he alone, will be exalted in that day. So this is what we have to get. It's to the point where we don't need any personal praise for anything. And we get our feelings hurt sometimes because we didn't get, uh, sometimes people didn't get uh, uh, recommended or didn't get this. And we have to realize now's the time not for us to be looking for our own pride and building up his spirit, giving all the glory to Yahweh. The lofty eyes of the proud shall be humbled, and the pride of man will be bowed down. But Yahweh, he alone will be exalted in that day. Verse 12. For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall be on all the proud and lofty ones, and on all that is lifted up, and it will be abased. Verse 15. And against every high tower, and against every fortified wall. The day of Yahweh of hosts will be on all the proud and lofty ones and on all those lifted up, right? Mindal tower lifted up. And it will be abased and against every tall tower and against every fortified wall. Wow. Bricks are fallen, but we will build with cut stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will substitute with cedars instead. This is Babylon's answer. Babylon's answer is, hey, you might hit us, but we'll hit you double as bad. You know, we can do this, we can do that, and yet... The whole reason why Yahweh is doing this in the end time is he's trying to humble. He's trying to humble us that he gets all the glory in this. And praise Yahweh that he gave us this seven. Praise Yahweh that he allowed President Trump to be elected and he gave us this seven. I pray for President Trump that he changes his attitude like Nebuchadnezzar and his pride that he has. But, you know, I pray for Yahweh's people even more because our refuge is in Yahweh who will tear down away the facade of Babylon, and we have to choose who we will serve. The system of Babylon, the corrupted Babylonian money system, or do we trust in Yahweh alone? If we do, then we have all the evidence we need that the corrupted worldwide money system of Babylon that is now getting ready to be judged before the mark of the beast will come, and it's too late, and we know we're close to it. We're halfway through the Shemitah cycle. Time is moving fast. And many times things begin to happen even in the sixth year. So it's not always when the Shemitah starts. A lot of times it's leading into the Shemitah. As Yom Teruah pictures the return of Yeshua, we need to see through the prophetic Shemitah cycle. The time is getting very close. Haksamayim.